but the saints are not. If we've got neighbors that are unsaved, and we all do, that is desperate. But the church is not. I lead in strategies across this nation, around the world, to touch the nations. But I'm telling you, it is still true. The light that shines the furthest shines the brightest at home. We must be brighter at home. Will you, will you, under God, say, God, save at least one person who's one of my neighbors. While you're running to the airport to go to the next nation, while you're getting on a plane or a bus or in your car to go across this state, Will you go next door in Jesus' name if you won't tell your neighbor who will? You may say, does people really want us to tell them? Yeah, they really do. Here's an email came this week. Wouldn't share it, but the time. Listen, you'll, you'll catch a glimpse of where it's coming from. I just wanted to give you an update on Daddy. We are now at the point where nothing else can be done. He is now totally under hospice care and he's in the hospital waiting for a room to become available at the hospice center. We are all doing as well as can be expected. But of course, we're overwhelmed with such great sadness. My mom's doing well, but I feel so sorry for her for losing the love of her life and how our whole life is changing. But God is faithful. He will sustain all of us. Today, I've been overwhelmed with gratitude for you. I will never be able to thank you enough for leading my daddy to the Lord in that truck all those years ago. I know Jesus does the saving, but I'm glad you were obedient to God to witness to the most precious man I know. Because of you, I know where my daddy will spend eternity. Thank God for his grace, mercy, and faithful servants. With a thankful heart, Sherry Stewart. Can I take you back for a moment? It's January the 7th, 1973. Aha, never heard of that day, have you? I got saved. I walked outside to my car. Remember, it was a snowy Sunday night. I got out there, had to clean the snow off my windshield. And looked beside me, there was a little white car. I don't remember what uh, make it was. It was really a big white car. There was a woman and four kids getting in it. A woman and four kids. That was Becky Brady and her four girls, the Brady Bunch. And uh, that night, uh, I saw that she did not have a man with her. And David, I went and cleaned her windshield. That's when we became friends. Since then, I've married three, you see that four, three of the four daughters. I couldn't uh, marry the fourth one, but I'll tell you what I did do. I led the fourth one's husband, James, to faith in Jesus Christ. And Freddie baptized him at Wrightsville Beach. Why Wrightsville Beach? He was a surfer. And he said, if this is a public profession to faith, take me publicly in front of those I surf with and baptize me around my friends. So after a Sunday morning service, I baptized him down there. Bill Brady, I was moving from Wake Forest, North Carolina after graduating from Southeastern Baptist Theology Seminary, and I was moving to Longleaf Baptist Church in Wilmington, North Carolina, and I needed somebody to move me, and they said, the company that Bill Brady works for is allowing him to move you. He sent a tractor-trailer truck to move me. I got to sit in the cab with him on the way back. Eh, I didn't have anything else to do. And so we talked about Jesus all the way, and I had the privilege of leading Bill Brady to the Lord. Why'd you share that? Look at me. Is everybody looking? Everybody looking? Bottom line, hospice care, about to draw his last breath. What's the most important thing? Are y'all listening? What's the most important thing before you draw? What's the, what? Hey, hey, hey. What's the most important thing before you draw your last breath? If you won't, if you won't, if you won't, who will? Evangelism. What are we going to do? We're going to be praying. I'm going to pray. Just start praying, God. What neighbor? What neighbor? Put somebody on my heart. Put a neighbor on my heart. Put a neighbor on my heart. Put a neighbor on my heart. Which one, Lord? Which one? And then engage them. How you doing? Catch them at, take their trash out. Catch them at the, when they're going to the mailbox. Go over and just visit. Introduce yourself. Go over and get better acquainted. And then as you have an opportunity, pray that God would let you invite them or sow a gospel seed. See, one person planted, another pla person watered. Are y'all listening? All the pressure's off. Only God can give the increase. Nobody can save but Jesus. But he chooses to use us to sow the gospel seed before he gives a harvest. Would you pray a prayer like this? In your heart, would you pray it? Lord, forgive me for being so silent to my neighbors. Help me to love loud, in Jesus' name, amen. 
love loud. Love loud. Let, let me talk to you about another area. It's one area we need to witness. God's going to use us. I'm going to keep it before you. It's going to make a difference. Number two, I'm concerned about foster care and adoption. Why, Pastor Johnny? I walk different places, run different places in my exercise. But a lot of times I like to take my car and go up to the Hopgood Park. There's signs out there reminding me that there's 800 abused. Are y'all listening? 800 abused and neglected children. And they would take them out of their home and put them in foster care. But there are no foster care homes. Beyond that, they, we've got about 200 foster care homes here. Would God be pleased if one of the largest Christian churches in the United States trained hundreds of its people at different levels, different levels, not everybody's going to bring kids in their homes, so stay with me, but that you would really consider being a foster parent, being an aide to a foster parent, maybe financially supporting somebody that wants them that can't afford them, helping somebody build out that bonus room so they can keep them, do special training here at the church. You believe God would be impressed if you help the child. The Lord Jesus Christ says something like this. I'll tell you, you, you find yourself abusing one of these little children would be better than a millstone was hung around your neck and you were drowned in the depths. I'm telling you, Jesus, how many of y'all believe Jesus really cares about youngins and children? Yes, sir. Uh, we have a family in our church that couldn't be here this morning. They were here last week. And last Sunday, I don't know if you remember this, so much was going on, but we uh, had two young ladies to join our church, 112, 114. So I asked their parents this week, if they'd write me a letter since they had to be out of town. So listen carefully to the letter, and then I want to show you a picture. I wanted to just write a short note to you about our search for a family and the unbelievable way our Heavenly Father has walked us through some tough times. As a couple, we're completely convinced that our God has chosen to express and show his love through relationship most beautifully in family. Our desire for the family was so very strong but remained unfulfilled. We know the instant elation and complete devastation of expecting and then losing a child. Been pregnant many times. And we have known this many, many times. Adoption was an alternative that was in our minds early, and yet we found ourselves frustrated in that process as well. What seemingly happened so easily for others was simply not happening with us. But in every sad moment, uh, there was a strong sense of calling to care about those around us, a calling to keep looking for children. Beth and I found ourselves drawn to seeking older children, a sibling group preferably, instead of seeking to adopt a baby. And we found ourselves wanting to help with kids right here at home and in our Jerusalem or Judea, not the ends of the earth. In our sanctified imagination, we ideally would find children from ages 5 to 9. You know, sometimes we tell the Lord what we're looking for instead of saying, Lord, what you want me to find? Hello, hello, hello. And so she goes on. What God put together, how it was, however, was exceeded our wildest dreams. A 14-year-old and a 12-year-old, sisters with all their wonderful personalities and real zeal for just growing up. Watching how our Father has begun to put together relationships with them and friends, kids, and their new cousins has been so completely awesome. To say that we are joyful cannot even come close to expressing where he has brought us. And this noble call to help others, well, we can safely say that we are sharing a blessing, not giving one. Ladies and gentlemen, would you meet two of our newest members, another adopted sisters, Madison and Michaela Fears. I think God is awesome. There they are, the whole family. It is almost a height of hypocrisy for a preacher to preach without expecting God to do something. I'm telling you, I want to believe God for some things. I'm telling you, I'm an intentional preacher. When I preach about giving, I believe the offerings are going to go up the next week. When I preach on salvation, I believe people will get saved. When I preach on the family, I believe homes will come back together. In other words, I'm not just talking to, because I've got a job. I've got a calling on my life, and you've got one on yours. If you'll listen, God is calling. God is calling. God is calling. And you've got to get this presupposition out of your mind of how you want him to talk. Third area, quickly, is missions. The Bible says in Acts 1-8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. The last words Jesus Christ ever spoke to the church is found in Matthew 28, 18. That is, he had nothing else to say after he said this. He ascended from the Mount of Olives. A cloud came and engulfed him. Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the ends of the age. Amen. That's his last words. I was young, 34 years old when you called me as your pastor. Some of you asked me in a question and answer time, what do you want to see God do here? And I said, Lord, give us a ministry upon which the sun never sets. We adopted Oswald Smith's statement, the light that shines the feathers shines the brightest at home. I've said in recent days we must go to our neighbors and to our nations. We must be praying for the nations, sending to the nations, and going to the nations. Did you know that every day in the world, 166,000 people hear the good news of Jesus Christ for the first time? They'd never heard. Did you know that every year, 27 million people profess faith in Christ as Savior for the very first time. What are you trying to say? I'm trying to say, are y'all listening to me? I'm overwhelmed. If you feel like you're a little bored with this sermon, it's because you're overwhelmed because God is moving in so many places and I have the privilege to join him. Not only in my service, in my giving, my going, my praying, I pray for this work. I write checks every week for this work. I go to these places, the hardest places. If I told you where I'm going in October, it'd blow you away. You'd start saying, we're going to pray and fast for him. Is he crazy? No, I'm saved. I'm called. I'm not going anywhere until God's through with me. And I'll go anywhere he calls me. And I expect you to do the same. I cannot understand, choir, why everybody wouldn't want to be a part of that. Can y'all? Y'all back here serving in the orchestra. Can y'all imagine why anybody wouldn't want to be involved? Can you hear anybody wouldn't want to be involved at some level? Some level, everybody, caring for people. For too long, the church has talked about what it does without doing it. It's time to allow our action to speak louder than our words. If you're visiting this morning and you've never been saved, God loves you and Christ died for you. God wants to save you. If you're walking at a guilty distance and want to draw near, I encourage you to do it. Respond to God and his love. Heavenly Father, draw people to yourself in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing, and we're going to invite you to respond in whatever way God would call you to respond. But hey, what's your GPS? What's your GPS? What's your G? Hey, in the balcony, what's your GPS? If you're not going to tell those that live around you where God planted you, what's their hope of ever hearing? Tell them.